Welcome to sermons from Silver Moon with Pastor Phil Barber of the Silver Moon Full Gospel Church. The Silver Moon Full Gospel Church is committed to preaching the Word of God and invites you to join them for Sunday morning worship at 10 a.m. and Wednesday night service at 6.30. Now, here's Pastor Phil Barber with today's message. And our text is going to be 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17, then 11, 26 through 32. And so we are going to gather around the Lord's table. And the Lord's table or supper is a wonderful gift from God. And as we said last week, it's a seal, it's a sign, it's a sermon of God's promises to all who have come to Christ in repentance and faith. And this morning, I want to give you four ways. You ought to get your Bibles out and write this down somewhere. Four ways you should partake of the Lord's Supper. Four things you should do. If you understand these four truths, you will be able to enter into the fullness of the Lord's Supper, and it will have some meaning and purpose to you. And so the first thing I want to tell you is about the Lord's Supper is it's to remember it is to look back, and we'll, read, we'll look at verses 23 through 25 in 1 Corinthians 11. And let me begin reading God's word. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying... This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This is God's word for God's people and all God's people said, thanks be to God. Twice in this passage, we are told to remember what Jesus did for us. At the Lord's table, Christ calls us to look back and remember his sacrifice for us on the cross When we partake of the bread and the cup, the bread is to remind us of the Christ body, which was given for you and for me. The cup is to remind us of Christ's blood, which was poured out, which was shed for you and me. It is interesting that Jesus gave out the bread first, then gave out the cup later. And to emphasize that this this morning... What we're going to do, and we have the, we are, we'll have the little c- communion cups. What we're going to do, we're going to take the wafer, and then we're going to pray over it. And then we'll take the juice, and then we'll pray after it. Because I want to make you understand, even Jesus took a little bit of time between uh, sharing those two elements. And so Jesus and Paul gives us a distinct significance in both the bread and the cup. And it's worth thinking about the significance of each of them. The first thing I want to look at is the bread. The bread speaks of Christ's body in which he lived a perfect human life. Jesus lived a life that none of us could ever achieve. He never spoke a simple word. He never had a simple thought. He always obeyed the Father's will. He always loved. He always hoped. He always believed. The body of Jesus speaks of his perfect life, which was given for you and me. He laid down that life in perfect obedience so that we who are far from the righteous of God may find in him what we do not have in ourselves. When we come to the Lord's table, sometimes we feel unworthy. But Christ reminds us, God reminds us, in the picture of the bread, that our salvation does not rest upon our efforts, but on the completion of the work of Christ for you and me. None of us has ever offered God perfect obedience, and we never will. But when we take the bread... We are reminded that God counts Christ's perfect obedience as if, if it were our own. Do you understand what I'm saying? We, through Christ, have his perfect obedience. We're in Christ. And that's what it means. God is not looking for us to be perfect. He's looking for us to be in Christ. And when he sees you and me, who've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he is seeing you in 
his son. And whatever his son did, he counts to you also. That's what it means to be heir and co-heir or join heir with God. So his perfect life was for me. When you look at that bread, I want you to realize it's speaking of his perfect obedience. He lived for you and me so God could give us grace, mercy, and forgiveness. Now, the cup speaks about the blood of Jesus poured out. Blood in the veins means life. The blood separated from the body speaks of death. The bread speaks of the Lord's obedience. The cup speaks of his sacrifice. Having no sin of his own, Jesus chose to bear our sins. He switched positions with you and me. He took our sin. He took our judgment. And if we receive his righteousness. We receive his victory. He became our sacrifice, absorbing the judgment of God. And through the shedding of his blood, he released forgiveness for you and me. God wants to seal in your heart this morning what Christ has done. He wants to give to you and me a picture. And that's what communion is. It is a sermon that Jesus Christ lived a perfect life for God. And he died on the cross for our sins. And when we take the cup and when we take the bread, we are remembering the life that Jesus lived and the death he died. And so the Lord's Supper begins as a meal in which the disciples shared fellowship with the Lord Jesus. Remember, he called them together. It was he that prepared the meal and got it all ready. He's the one who shared it with them. And Jesus Christ does the same for you and me this morning. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God. But through this meal, this supper this evening, this morning... We're going to draw near to him by faith, and he is going to be in our presence. And the bread and the cup remind you that Jesus will sustain your soul as food sustains your body. Now, I want you to imagine something. Imagine going to a fine restaurant. You're seated at the table. You're given a menu. And in the menu, there's pictures of the food. And when the waiter comes, he explains the menu. And he recommends his favorite entrees. Have you ever gone to restaurant and think, what, what's your specialty? What, what do you recommend? But suppose after you sat down and you read the menu, you looked at the pictures, you heard the waiter, you got up and left without ordering any food or eating. The reason you go to a restaurant is not to look at pictures. And to hear about food. It goes so you can have something to eat to nourish your body. And when you come to the Lord's table, you order what's on the menu. And there's only two things on the menu. The bread and the cup. And tell the Lord what you want. What do you want? You want what the Lord has promised. What do you recommend? I recommend mercy. I recommend grace. I recommend victory. I recommend my word. I recommend that you believe my promises. So tell the Lord, I want this morning, Lord, what you promised. Tell him you're hungry for a fresh touch of his love. Tell him this morning you want to see more of his glory. Tell him, you say, Lord, and it talks about it. I want the taste of your goodness. Tell him your soul is dry and thirsty. Tell him you need to be renewed by the work of the Holy Spirit. And the Lord's table this morning gives you the opportunity to draw near to him by faith to be nourished by him. So this morning when you come to the Lord's table... Tell him what you want. Tell him what you need. Tell him what you desire. So when you come to the Lord's table this morning, look up to the risen Savior and ask and receive from him. Remember what he did for you. Remember what he's promised to you. 
and ask the Lord for that. And so when we come to the Lord's table, we remember. We remember. We look back. And then the next thing we do is we repent. We look in. Read in verse 27 and 28, it says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. I mean, now, I want you to hang in here with me. But you can't come in rebellion. You can't come where you, let me put it, and I'm going to say it, let me say it again, but let me just say it. You can't come if you have sin in your life that you refuse to give up. I'm not saying you're struggling with. There is a difference. We're going to preach some sermons out of 1 John. And one of the great dilemmas we face in the church, and especially a church like ours, and I will tackle it, is what I do about sin. Can I sin? Do I sin? Should I You know, not should I. But what I do if I do sin? Because there'll be some people who tell you, you're not, you Christians shouldn't sin. And that's, uh, that's a lie. And we'll see that in First John. But let me say this, and I'll say it again and again. If Jesus Christ would show up to you today and say, that sin you're struggling with, Will you give it up? If you say, I'll give it up, you can come to the table. But you'll say, well, not right now. I don't want to give it up right now. I want to hang on to it for a while longer. I'd question your salvation, first of all. And second of all, say you're not worthy to come to the table. There's a difference in struggling and refusing. Now, God will help you in your struggles. Because a person who says, let me take it farther. If you're struggling and you hate it and you despise, breaking your heart, breaking your family's heart, breaking God's heart. And God said, I'll take it now. And if you said, take it, take it, take it, there's hope for you. But if you say, like I said, not right now. I want to keep it around a little longer. Let me use this illustration. I never start a diet on Thursday or Friday or Wednesday or Tuesday. And I don't on Sunday. It's church day and might go out and eat. Always start on Monday. But you can't do that with sin. You can't say, well, I'll go through the weekend. (laughs) And then Monday I'll get rid of it. Not when God comes and offers to take it away from you. That's why 1 John will be important to all of us. So when you come to the Lord's table... Christ calls on you to ask yourself some honest questions. This is important because Paul says, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty. It would be the same as crucifying the Lord concerning the body and the blood of the, of the Lord. What's it mean? What's, it means you're, you're not living right. So here's two questions you probably ought to ask yourself when you examine your life. Am I believing? Am I believing? Look at the cross. What does it mean to you? That's what it says. Remember. Consider what God says through the pitcher, the bread, and the cup. That Christ lived a perfect life for you and that he shed his blood for you. Do you believe that the Son of God loved you and gave himself for you? If the answer is yes, you can come to the table and take the bread and cup. If the answer is no, if you're saying no... I'd rather have my sin than Jesus right now. 
I wouldn't come to the cup. I wouldn't take of it. I would wait. You need to come. But you need to come saying, Lord, I need your grace. I need your help. I need your forgiveness. If you're willing to come and say, Christ, I need your touch on my life. I need your salvation. I need your grace. I need your mercy because I want to live for you. Amen. Are you repenting or be another thing? Am I believing? Am I repenting? Are you saying, Lord, I am a sinner. I am guilty. I need your salvation. I need your grace. I need your mercy. Because the devil is for sinners who are saved by grace. Who have come through the Lord Jesus Christ through repentance and faith. And they see their need of Jesus. People who think, I'm okay. I'm self-righteous. I'm better. I'm as good as anybody else. Who think they're saved by their deeds and their good works. Have no business coming to the Lord's table. When we come to the Lord's table, we are publicly professing. You know what we're saying today? When we take the Lord's table, Lord, I have no goodness. I have no righteousness. I'm not worthy on my own. All my hope rests in you. You're my solid rock. You're my firm foundation. When we come to take of the Lord's Supper, we are public and professing that we are guilty, we are sinful, we are corrupt, and we naturally, we deserve the wrath of God and God's condemnation. And anyone who's self-righteous and thinks they're okay, this table's not for them. The Lord's table is for sinners. One of the things we said, no one's perfect here. If anyone thinks... That church is about perfect people. They don't understand church. We're all sinners. We all need God's grace. We all need God's mercy. But if you're not going to give up a known sin in your life, I would encourage you not to come. If there's a sin you find difficult to give up, don't come. But if there's a sin... Uh, if there's a sin that you find difficult to give up, come. I'll say it that way. But if there's a sin you refuse to give up, come. If you say, I know what I'm doing is wrong, but I'm going to continue doing it. You're shutting yourself off from the grace of God. That's a hard heart. The Bible says, let the wicked forsake his way. The unrighteous man has thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may com- have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. God will receive anyone who's willing to say, I have sinned, God, and I'm coming to you for your grace and your mercy and your help. Save me. Amen. I read this story. Anne Graham Lotz. She's the daughter of Billy Graham. She was speaking about prayer and told of a time she took 10 days to prepare a series of messages. On the first day, she sat down with her notebook and her Bible, and nothing came to her. There's nothing like that when you're studying for a message and nothing comes to you. It's, I mean, it seems like heaven shut, everything, nothing, but that's where she was. The same thing happened on the second day. She then recounts, read in a pamphlet on how revivals were related to repentance. Someone had given her this pamphlet and had challenged her to read it three times. She said, the first time I read this pamphlet, I felt smug. I'm okay. Nothing wrong with me. The second time she read it, she felt spiritual. The third time she read it, she said, I broke down. And began to weep. She said, I took seven days of confessing my sins. This is a lady who speaks around the world. Raised in the home of Billy Graham. Seven days of confessing sins. When I read that, I thought, oh God, help me. I'm wicked. I kind of do that in 10 seconds and move on. Not you. Not, well, no one here is like that, but. Seven days. 
She said, I repented of sins. I didn't know I had. As the Spirit of God began to speak, I repented of pride. I repented of anger. I repented of judgmentalism. I repented of prayerlessness, just to name a few. It was after seven days of repentance, seven days of confessing sins, that a spiritual surge flowed through her, and God filled her with messages for her speaking engagement. Do you have any sins that you need to confess before you take the Lord's Supper today? Is there anyone you need to ask forgiveness from? Is there anyone you need to extend forgiveness to? How is it with your spouse? How is it with your children? Repent. Get right with God. And get right with one another. Did not the Lord's Prayer say, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors? That's a part of who we are as Christians, people who are forgiven and who extend forgiveness. And let us never forget that. This is close to the next one. It's to reconcile. Look around. This is my body, which is for you. Listen to me. We are all part of one body. And no one is better than anyone else. Those who think, have this idea... That people who come to church think they're better than anybody else. Don't know a thing about us and understand anything about who we are. I'm the chief of sinners. I know it. The Apostle Paul is an old man. When he's about ready to step over into heaven. Writes and says. I've told you this one time before, long before this, he wrote, I'm the least of all the apostles. And then a little later, he wrote, I'm the least of all the saints. But as an old man, he wrote, I am the chief of sinners. He understood that whatever he was, he was by the grace of God Almighty. And if it wasn't for the grace of God Almighty, he would have been the chief of sinners. And he was. The only thing that kept him from being it was God's grace and God's salvation. It should never be said of anyone here that we think we're better than anybody else. When you take the bread and when you take the cup, you're saying, there's nothing that I have done, but Lord, you have done it all for me. But look around, because we're living in a union. We're in a community. We could call communion... Our common union. Common union. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. It's God's kingdom. We're all a part of God's kingdom. We're all a part of God's reign. We are all citizens of the kingdom of God. It says in 1 Corinthians ten seventeen, Because there is one bread. We who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one bread. See, we're taking of the one bread. It's We're all in this together. Just before Jesus went to the cross, in John 17, he prayed this prayer. But this is the number one thing on the mind of Jesus before he goes to the cross. This is what he says. Holy Father, keep them in your name. You have given me, which you have given me. That they may be one, even as we are one. The unity of this church of believers is crucial to our Lord and crucial to the mission of this church. Fellowship means we're in the same ship. We're all working together. We're all rowing the same in the same direction. It is a unity of a church that puts power on display. Healing power, saving power, resurrection power. The divine gospel is most powerfully displayed when the church is one and united. The world says there's the... (laughs) Here's Here's what the liberals and wokes try to tell you. There's power in our diversity. Well, you see that going on, right? Painting the fence of the White House... 
red paint like blood. There's no power in diversity. Never has been. Nowhere in the history of the world. There's power in unity. Power in oneness of thought. thought. The Holy Spirit came on the day when they were all in one accord. United, together. And the word you here is plural. It's all of us together. You can't, you can't have communion on your own. The Lord's Supper is for the Lord's family. We're to dine together. We're saying when we come to the Lord's Supper, it's appropriation. We're appropriating the Lord's redemption, what he's done for us. But we're also participating together and saying we're one community with one Lord. And we are one in uni- we are one together. They, Paul, Jesus said the night he was betrayed, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you. Christ wants the whole family to gather at his table. And it doesn't matter whether you're young or old, rich or poor, black or white, pastor or labor, uh, pastor or lay leader, or Bible scholar or Bible novice, novice, we all receive the same invitation to come to the Lord's table because we all need the same Savior. We all come to the same cross, the same table. We all have the same cross. So when we come to the Lord's Supper, we give thanks as a family, as a family of God. We're to pray for one another when we're here. We're to look around here this morning. And you know what we're supposed to really be doing? Is look for an opportunity to bless someone, to encourage someone, to help someone. You should not go home before you've encouraged someone. Or you've spoken to someone in a positive way, in an encouraging way. You, when you sing in church, when we sing these worship songs, you need to sing, and because you you need to realize, I need to sing out because I mean, someone need need to be encouraged, someone need to be lifted up, someone need to be inspired to sing. You need to praise that way. When we praise the Lord, praise the Lord so you might encourage someone. Worship to encourage others. Just being here, Sunday after Sunday, encourages other people. Greet someone. Encourage them. Look around and say, how can I bless someone? How can I touch someone's life? That's what Christianity is about. But the final thing we ought to do is rejoice, look forward. Also, Paul wrote in verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Lord's Supper looks backward to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it looks forward and anticipation of his glory. Thank you for listening to Sermons from Silver Moon with Pastor Phil Barber. To find out more about today's message, you may contact the Silver Moon Full Gospel Church at 417 472 3360. The Silver Moon Full Gospel Church is located on Highway 59 North between Neosho and Diamond, Missouri. Morning worship is at 10 a.m. with a Wednesday night service at 6.30 p.m. The Silver Moon Full Gospel Church, where the distance is worth the difference. Never miss your favorite show again. For more than 30 years, KNEO has been bringing you great Bible teachers on a local and national level. And now, we've made it easier than ever to hear from these great men and women of God. KNEO's entire lineup is now available to listen anytime, anywhere, through our website. Go to KNEO.org slash podcast to see all the options. You can search for programs alphabetically, or you can select individual categories like culture, kids, leadership, or music. We even have a category just for locally produced programs, so you can hear from pastors and spiritual leaders located right here in the four-state area. And... All these resources are absolutely free. Kaneo's mission is to get God's Word in front of you, and this is one of the ways we do it. Give it a try today. Go to kaneo.org and click on the podcast tab to get started.